Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, next, we have Amy Maja. Yes. Is that right? <laughs> Uh, she's a PhD student of the uh, University of Manitoba. Um, uh, she's a uh, plant science uh, at the University of Manitoba, and her project focuses on uh, spring wheat management for improving yield efficiencies and decreasing lodging potential. All right. Amy, take Thanks. it away. Thanks. Um, so those were kind of some heavy topics. We're going to switch gears hard here. Uh, we're going to move to agronomy of spring wheat. So we're really going to talk about plant growth regulators and primarily in cereals, uh, really just spring wheat. Uh, with MRLs being lifted in the United States uh, in, for the 2018 season, it really opened up our ability to kind of really use this on a wide acreage. So I'm going to talk to you guys about some of the small plot as well as on-farm trials that we had uh, across Manitoba in 2018. So the primary purpose for these plant growth regular applications is for lodging. So we're trying to decrease our lodging risk because when lodging does occur, it doesn't happen every year, but when it does, there's large costs that come along with it. So there's yield losses 10 to 40% typically when you have significant lodging, uh, up to 80% in extreme cases. We have decreases in kernel weight, decreases in milling and baking quality, as well as increased uh, mycotoxin presence. And then any of you that have ever tried to slug along with your combine in the fall trying to pick up lodged wheat understands that cost of harvest increase uh, when you have a significantly lodged portion of a field. Where am I pointing this? So lodging in cereals, with some of the new spring wheat varieties that we are growing across Manitoba, they have extremely high yield potential. So we have yield potential of up to or over 100 bushels an acre with most of our new varieties. And with that comes extremely high nitrogen requirements. And we're also, there's been a push for higher seeding rates. So we're wanting to push a high seeding rate to try to get that uniform stand for Fusarium head blight application. But the high nitrogen rates as well as the high seeding rates lead to increased risk of lodging. And there's actually two types of lodging that influence spring wheat in Manitoba, or everywhere, really. Uh, the two types of lodging are the first one being stem lodging. So stem lodging is typically what you think of when you think of lodging. It's when that head, the weight of the head, as well as the movement from the wind or a rainstorm, causes uh, the breakage of the stem at that lower internode. And those are kind of called, and that's called stem lodging. And then we also have root lodging. Root lodging is actually when the soil gets sat super saturated during after periods of a lot of rainfall and the weight of that entire plant actually exceeds that anchorage strength. So the whole plant falls over from the root system, but the stem is still intact. So I've actually seen, I encourage you if you don't actually know what type of lodging that you are, that your production system's most prone to, to go out and check it out. I've actually found in the last few years that I've seen more root lodging than stem lodging uh, across Manitoba anyways. And that could be due to breeding efforts to try increase stem strength is actually just shifting our lodging over to root lodging versus stem lodging. Uh, and now looking at plant growth regulators. So what are plant growth regulators? They're synthetic compounds that alter hormonal activity. And for cereals, we're actually wanting to decrease our, we're, we use our plant growth regulators to decrease shoot length through decreases in cell elongation as well as cell division. And this really just allows us to make in-crop adjustments or possibly go in if we have a variety that might not have a great lodging rating to start off with to be able to enable us to maybe grow some of those varieties that we weren't confident growing before because of a risk of lodging. And plant growth regulators are not a new, not new across the world by any means. They're actually used ex very widely, especially in the horticultural industry, but in terms of stem shortening in small grains, uh, in Europe where they have, primarily they grow winter wheat and they have long growing seasons where there's damp and they have high lodging risk, they average 1.7 applications of plant growth regulators a year on their winter wheat. So what are the plant growth regulators that we kind of have available to us here in Western Canada to use? The first one being manipulator, which 
um, you guys are probably familiar with, if you are, have worked at all with a plant growth regulator, is currently registered in wheat for Manitoba. Uh, it's marketed by Engage Agro, and chlormaclot chloride is the active ingredient in that uh, product. It is not registered for use in wheat and barley, and it is not registered for use with any tank mix par products, so with any fungicides or herbicides. I'm not saying the good people of Manitoba have never used it as a tank mix with herbicide or fungicide, but I'm just saying it's not registered. And it markets for about $15 an acre, so it's not a cheap product to throw in, as well as application costs, because as you'll see, the timing of application doesn't uh, line up really with a fungicide or herbicide timing. And then uh, coming soon, we also have MODIS, which is currently registered in the States, as well as in Europe, it's been used widely. Uh, in the States, it's actually registered under the trade name of Palisade, but in Manitoba, it will be, or in Canada, it will be registered as MODIS. It's from Syngenta. It is uh, similar to Manipulator as it's a gibberellin inhibitor, uh, but it is not currently registered. Anticipation is for registration for mid-2019, which in turn means it will only be available for the 2020 growing season because it would be registered after when in time to apply it in 2019. Just quickly, both these products do uh, block the synthesis of gibberellin biosynthesis. What that means, gibberellin, so gibberellin, uh, gibberellic acid actually is a plant hormone that promotes shoot elongation. So as you had guessed, these two, plant or, or these two plant growth regulators actually stop the production of gibberellic acid. This GA1 here at the bottom is the active form of gibberellic acid. So manipulator actually stops that pathway uh, at the beginning or closer to where, at the start. And trinexapac ethyl or MODIS actually is closer to the bottom of where the actual bioactive form is. But because they both affect the same pathway, you'd expect pretty similar results from the two products, though there are some differences. This is just uh, application window timing that I used, took from the Engage Agro website. And I just really wanted to point out that here the manipulator application window is quite wide. It's registered from the two leaf up to the flag leaf stage in spring wheat. So, but they do indicate that their ideal timing is that growth stage 30 to 32. So even though it has a wide application window, of uh, when it can be applied, they still think that that short application between growth stage 30 to 32, when that stem's starting to elongate, is when you're gonna see the best results. We here in Manitoba aren't doing, or I'm not doing any uh, work on specifically on the timing of application. This is work done out of Indian Head Research Foundation by Chris, and he looked at the effect of height on the top as well as lodging on the bottom. when plant growth regulator was applied, was not applied, versus when it was applied at the early stage, so two leaf, the optimum timing, 31, as well as the late timing of their window of flag leaf. And he saw that irregardless of what timing manipulator was applied, he saw good decreases in height, as well as good decreases in lodging with all application timings. But this was a large multi-year study at different sites, and even though the majority of the time he was seeing good responses across that application window, he still recommends that growth stage 30 to 32 was the most consistent um, timing so that he was getting consistent responses as well as it allowed for buffering uh, for variable crop stages within a field. So as many of you know, a crop field is not perfectly uniform by any means. So at that 30 to 32 stage really allowed him to get, or he, where he saw that he was getting the best bang for his buck consistently from year to year. And then what that optimum timing stage actually looks like. So to look at this, we really have to understand how that plant grows. So once it's done tillering, the main stem actually forms a tiny head or spike at ground level. And then that stem starts moving up the, starts moving up the stem as the stem elongates. So it's kind of hard to see, but this is actually the tiny head and it's starting to move up. So it was formed here. It's starting to move up and it's formed the first node. So that's growth stage 31. Growth stage 30, that first node hasn't formed yet. And then consecutively as that stem, or as that head moves up the stem, you can see that more nodes start being formed. And that's 32, two nodes, 33, three nodes, 
all the way up to when you hit your flag leaf stage, which is considered growth stage 39. And in our trials in 2017, 2018, we found this timing to be typically around the second week in June. So I'm moving on, I'm going to look at our small plot trials. And our small plot trials look at a large variety of factors. Uh, we're looking at how agronomic management practices uh, can reduce lodging in spring wheat. So not just plant growth regulators, but we're looking at varieties, nitrogen management, planting densities, as well as PGRs. And then we're looking at the interactions of them uh, together as a whole. But for today, I'm just going to focus on the plant growth regulators, as well as any interactions we might have seen with the plant growth regulators in these trials. And this trial ran in 2018, and it will run again in 2019. So this is just preliminary work on, on height, yield, and protein for these trials. Oh. This project was actually run through two different experiments, just because we were looking at a large number of factors. So we looked at three spring, spring wheat varieties, Brandon, Cameron, and Prosper. Cameron being actually a tall variety. So it has a good lodging uh, rating, but it's a tall variety compared to Brandon and Prosper. And then we had uh, five different nitrogen management strategies, 100 or 0, 70, and 40 pounds applied at planting, and then a split application of 70 pounds at planting, 70 pounds at flag leaf, and then an ESN blend. And then manipulator was applied at growth stage 31 on every combination of nitrogen and variety. And then experiment two looked at planting density, so low, medium, and high target densities. Uh, and then we had nitrogen timing, so up front or a split application. And then again, plant growth regulator applied plus or minus on all of those treatments. In 2018, our small plot trials were conducted in Carmen as well as Manitou. And we're going to jump into the results here. Uh, in 2018, this, many of you know that anyone that was farming in 2018, it was dry. We actually saw pretty short wheat to start off with. So we didn't see some of the height decreases or large height decreases that we would expect. But we did still see, so these tables, sorry, I'm just going to back up. These tables that you'll see at the top of the next couple slides, don't worry too much of it. The, one, the rows highlighted in red are really the factors that include plant growth regulator. And if their p-values are bolded, it means that I'm 95% confident in my trials that those factors had an effect on, in this case, canopy height. So in Carmen, we saw plant growth regulator as well as variety by plant growth regulator had a significant effect on plant height. What that looks like, sorry, Carmen first. What that looks like is that in Carmen, each variety had a decrease in height, but our tall variety, Cameron, actually decreased in height more than our two semi-dwarf varieties. More stem, more room for a height decrease there. So that was kind of expected, but then in Manitou, we actually didn't see that interaction with variety. So this is combined across varieties as well as nitrogen because we had no significant interactions. And we saw a very small, only about four centimeters. But again, the wheat was short to start off with. Uh, so we only had about four centimeter height decrease there. For experiment two, uh, in Carmen, we saw a trend of decreased height for plant growth regulator on both nitrogen timings, but it was only actually significant when nitrogen was applied as a split application with a 6.1 centimeter height decrease. And then in Manitou, we saw a significant height decrease irregardless of when the nitrogen was applied. And again, small, only about three to five centimeter height decreases there. Moving on to grain yield. Grain yield, which Surprised me, I had no significant interactions with grain yield. So I had a significant effect of plant growth regulator at Carmen and Manitou, irregardless of what variety I grew and how the nitrogen was applied. So there is no lodging at this site, which is really important to note that both these sites in 2018, I had no lodging. So 2018, bad year to be studying lodging, but a very good year to look at what we can expect from these products if we don't have lodging. So irregardless of lodging, so we didn't have any yield decreases due to lodging, but the application of manipulator did actually increase my grain yield significantly at both trial locations. It was about three or 2.3 in Manitou and three bushels an acre at that Carmen site. Uh, for experiment two, it was a little more inconsistent for our grain yield. 
In Carmen, I did not see any significant increases in grain yield or decreases. There was, uh, they were similar to the untreated and the treated checks. At, in Manitou, I saw a significant increase in grain yield of 3.6 bushels an acre, but only when the nitrogen was applied at planting. So when I applied my nitrogen as a split application, I didn't see that yield benefit. Moving on to grain protein content, for experiment one, we actually only saw a significant effect of plant growth regulator in Carmen, and there was no effect in Manitou. Again, there was no lodging. But we can see we saw a significant protein decrease at Carmen of 0.22 of a percent. So it was a small decrease, but it was significant. And we did see the trend in Manitou, but it wasn't significant. For experiment two, though, we had much greater response in terms of protein. So in Carmen, we saw significant protein decreases when nitrogen was applied at both timings, and as well in Manitou. So our split nitrogen applications had increased protein content, which uh, was very similar to what we'd expect based on previous research. So the split application had higher protein content than when nitrogen was applied entirely up front. But at both nitrogen timings, we were seeing decreases in protein content with manipulator being applied. Um, some 2018 additional observations that we saw. Again, this is only one site year in two locations, so we can't take any of this to heart. Uh, but this is what we were seeing in 2018. Uh, we saw increased tillering. So we saw more shoots per plant. We actually saw delayed maturity. You can see in this picture on the right, when no PGR was applied, we were heading out compared to when the PGR was applied. It was about one to two days delayed. And then we saw decreases in kernel weight. So we actually had smaller, lighter, lighter kernels with our manipulator application, but there was more of them. More of them because there was increased tillering, more heads per acre. So we had more grain, but the grain itself was smaller. And again, this is all in the absence of lodging. Lodging affects a lot of these factors I'm talking about today. Lodging will affect that. So we would see a greater spread in some of these responses if we had lodging present. But in 2018, we did not. Uh, I want to talk just quickly about the on-farm trials that the wheat and barley growers run. So this one ran in 2018, and it'll hopefully run again in 2019. And it was a pretty simple on-farm trial looking at the impact of manipulator on plant height and yield of spring wheat. So the protocol, again, was very simple. A uh, grower managed their field as they would normally, and then they went in at growth stage 31 and applied manipulator on four alternating strips with an un untreated check. So just an example of how those are laid out in the field with field long strips on the right. They weren't. Uh, here's a look at how it, those were distributed throughout the province in 2018. We had 10 grower locations indicated by a stars there. So just look at where the spread was. And then the on-farm trial results. So again, I'm just going to do height, yield, and protein for today. Um, when looking at the sites individually, we saw 8 out of 10 sites significantly having a yield or a height decrease with manipulator applied. But when we look at this little ANOVA table at the top, we actually see that there is no significant interaction between treatment and location, which indicates that we had similar trends at every site. So that allowed us to kind of combine our site years and uh, indicate that we did have a significant decrease in height across all sites. And it worked out to about 10% of the, of the untreated uh, plant height. Looking at yield, Individually, we only had two sites that had significant yield increases, but when we combined sites, again, we had no interaction indicating that we had a similar trend of increased yield at every site, even though it was only significant at two sites individually. Uh, and when we combined, an, when we did a combined analysis, there was a significant yield increase with the manipulator application compared to an untreated. And again, it was only around that two and a half to three bushels per acre. Grain protein content, we actually didn't see the decreases in protein content except for one site at Marquette where we had a very significant decrease in protein content, 
It was about 1.5%, uh, I think. But when we combined our data, there was actually no significant decrease. There was a slight trend again, but it wasn't significant uh, at the combined, or when we combined our analysis for that. And this is just the aerial imagery from some of these sites, so you can kind of have an idea of what those really looked like. Um, these were prepared by Greg Bartley at the Pulse and Soybean Growers. And unlike our small plots, we actually did see some lodging in, this on, in the on-farm trials. You can see down here the untreated plots. You can kind of see where the lodging was. It might kind of be hard for you to see. But there was some lodging, and it was mostly present in our untreated checks of those on-farm trials. So in summary, kind of summarizing our on-farm and our small plot work from 2018, in terms of plant height, we saw decreases in both our small plot and our on-farm trials compared to the untreated control. The magnitude of that height difference kind of depended on variety, especially in the small plot, but it did work out to about 10% of the untreated check. Grain yield was a little variable, so we saw increases of 2.3 to 3.1 bushels an acre in small plot experiment one, but in experiment two, we only saw an increase in Manitou, and it was 3.6 bushels when nitrogen was applied entirely at planting, and there was no influence in Carmen for experiment two. And across all the on-farm locations, manipulator increased grain, pro, or grain yield by 2.7 bushels an acre. And looking at grain protein content, uh, it was de significantly decreased at three out of the four small plot experiments. And grain protein content was not significantly influenced across small plot or across on-farm trial locations. So what I really want to emphasize here is this is just kind of the start of this project. There's a lot more data to come. Additionally, there's a whole other growing season in 2019 still, but we also have a lot more data, especially the small plot. We look at a lot more factors than just plant growth regulators in terms of uh, tools to kind of manage your lodging, uh, as well as there's a 2019 season for the on-farm trials as well. So with that, I'm just gonna kind of wrap up and thank, of course, everybody that had anything to do with this project. It was a, it's a big project and it's still ongoing. Wheat and barley growers are our funders. They're huge in allowing this agronomic research to go on in the province. Uh, and then all the on-farm grower participants, as well as the Andy Keene and Alvin Irison that allowed us to do small plot, uh, trials at their locations and then engage agro for product and all technicians and summer students that helped with this. And with that, I can take any questions. I will also be around for the rest of the wheat and barley growers session if you want to catch up with me or you can also, my contact information is up there. So feel free to send me an email if you can't catch me today. Thank you, Amy. That's on. Oh, it's on. <laughs> oh, it's on now. Thank you, Amy. Uh, we have time for one question. Hello. Okay. It's on. Uh, nice presentation, Amy. Um, can you, do you have enough data to dissect whether the yield increases were coming from a taller variety compared to a semi-dwarf? because your analysis right now is a combined analysis. So can you say that the yield increase was more from a taller variety compared to a semi-dwarf or vice versa? So our yield increases were actually, there was no interaction with variety. So we weren't seeing, we were seeing the three varieties that we tested actually responded all the, like they all responded similarly to manipulator application. Where we were seeing our yield increases when we looked into it a little bit more was due to kernel numbers. So we were just seeing more shoots per acre across all varieties. So it wasn't, I couldn't separate it out by variety, but I could just separate why I saw that was due to increased tillering. In terms of why we're seeing increased tillering and kind of why we're seeing those protein decreases, that's in the data that still is waiting to be analyzed. But we are looking into kind of why we're seeing these as well. 